The Oklahoma Sooners are moving on up. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Shout out to all the everydayers. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Also with the Oklahoma Sooners playing on SEC Network this week, if you don't have that, you might want to look into YouTube TV because... SEC Network is on YouTube TV, and you get all the great content that comes from over there as well. You get to watch Dari Noka, you get to watch Paul Feinbaum, all kinds of great shows and content over on SEC Network. This is not an SEC Network plug. I've just been a YouTube YouTube TV guy for a long time. Same. So if you're looking for if you're looking for a way to watch the game, that might be your way. You can probably get a free trial for this week and see how you like it. Anywho, welcome to Locked On Sooners. That's Jay Smith. I'm John Williams, and thanks so much to Jay for covering for me in the last couple of. Uh, Two episodes in the last week or so, sickness just rolling through the house, dealing with COVID, but we're making it work. And the Oklahoma Sooners are making it work too. Got that 51-3 to win over Temple on Friday night and moving up in the AP and USLBM coaches poll. Let's start with the coaches poll because this is where they made the biggest jump. They moved from number 16 all the way up to number 13 in the, in the nation. Taking spots as AM dropped back, as Clemson drops back, as Florida State drops back, the Oklahoma Sooners get a big jump there, Jay. Yeah, we, we, we got a lot of love there. And, you know, even with AP and as well as even ESPN's uh, football power index, which is pretty interesting. Talk about that in a minute. But it's good to see that we got a little bit of recognition, right? USC flew up nine spots right underneath us at 14 with Tennessee right above. So we've got what? One, two, three, four, five teams ahead of us that we still have to play. So we have to see how they look this coming season to determine if, you know, they'll be at that point when we play them. But as of right now, us in Tennessee are neck and neck. Yeah, and Oklahoma moved up just one spot in the AP poll, still sitting one spot behind Tennessee, uh, who had a big win uh, over the weekend as well. This is a this is going to be a big matchup. You know, the Oklahoma Sooners and Tennessee Volunteers, that's going to be one that everybody has their eyes on September 21 because it'll be Oklahoma's first game in the SEC as like a conference game in the SEC. It'll be Jackson Arnold's first start against an SEC team. It'll be Nico Yamaleava's first start against an SEC team as well. So two former five-star quarterbacks going at it. Josh Heupel's return. Some really, really good prospects on the Tennessee side of things. Some really talented players on Oklahoma side of things. That'll be really, really exciting as well. You look at kind of some of the others receiving votes and two lanes in the mix, others receiving votes. Mm -hmm. Auburn's in the mix of others receiving votes. So there's potential that by the time that Oklahoma plays either of those two teams that are not currently ranked, that they could potentially be ranked by the time they get to Oklahoma on the schedule. So just really, you know, kind of fascinating to see that. Any, what was kind of your biggest reaction when you saw the, the latest polls there, Jay? Yeah, you know, Clemson falling down eight spots. Florida State is no longer ranked. They're the top 10 team that unexpectedly ended uh, up outside of it. And I'm wondering if that finishes the entire season, right? I want the whole season ends up that way. But on that too, next week we'll have Tennessee versus NC State. So as you mentioned, we have Tulane as well as Auburn kind of sitting on the outside. When Tennessee plays NC State this week, depending on who wins that game, there's a very good chance that Tulane jumps up into the rankings right before we play them. So then in that in that note, we'll probably play what what's that eight or nine teams that are ranked in the top twenty five at the time that we face them. Ooh, that's going to be hu hu huge, and it's going to really look nice on the resume. Yeah, there's about only one team right now that I don't feel confident is going to be ranked by the time Oklahoma plays them, and that's South Carolina, who struggled with Old Dominion. We're going to Maine. get into an SEC and Maine. I don't, I don't even <laughs> or Houston. I know. I mean, Houston's I don't, not going to be ranked this week I just want to either. say it. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about the SEC as we do an SEC recap from week one in the third segment, but... Yeah, I think Oklahoma, again, you're right where you need to be. You're right where you kind of probably should be. I've, I saw one dude, a Nevada uh, beat writer for the Associated Press, vote Oklahoma as high as four. And listen, you all know me. I am as optimistic of a Sooner fan as there might be in Sooner Nation. I ain't voting them four. I'm not Look, voting. 
look, I saw your post and I posted underneath the picture of Thanos. Hey, they called him a madman. You never know. Hey, never, hey, if he comes through, I hope he's right. <laughs> if he's spot on, how crazy would that be that he predicted it that early? Because he is the only one that has us in the top ten. And I thought that was quite fascinating when I went through and scrolled through all those names. Yeah, so I mean, we could be sitting here uh, at the end of the season being like Thanos was right about you know trying to wipe out half the population or about Oklahoma being ranked number four. Right. Sorry. That's a that's an Avengers <laughs> deep cut there. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, this is a this is a team that I mean they're really, really good defensively. How good they are offensively, I think we still don't quite know that yet. But I think we can feel pretty comfortable where they are as a defensive football team. And not just because of Temple, but because of what they did a year ago, what they added in the offseason, who they brought back, and the development that was noticeable uh, in week one against Temple. So you're, you're looking at a team that, I mean, is this going to be a defensive football team where you're not relying on your quarterback to throw the ball 40 times a game, where you're trying to play ball control offense and let your defense win you football games? Is that a possibility? I mean, I, I don't know, but as I think more about the way that the game played out the other day, I mean, that was like a Baltimore Ravens early 2000s type of a game plan where you now I'm not going to sit here and compare Trent Dilfer to, to Jackson Arnold. Jackson Arnold's got a much, much higher ceiling, mm -hmm. but what they were asking Jackson Arnold to do and not do in that game was very much a, Hey, don't worry about it. Our defense has got us. We don't need you to overextend things or put the ball in harm's way. We got it. Right. And that was why you saw it as a scripted play, right? Like the, the play call was just to see what we look like in certain scenarios. I know some people don't like that and that's fine. I mean, I, you don't have to like it because I didn't like it either. But at the same time, I'm just going to put it out there factually. You know, BV said it was there. They didn't run all the scripts that they wanted to and they wanted to take their time. And also only having it at the 50 most of the time kind of takes away some of the fun you really want to have, right? We like to see 70 yard touchdowns. You know, 40s are okay, but you know, 70s are so much funner. And so for us, I know that they have nothing but comfort with Jackson Arnold. That 47 yarder to. Jaleel Farouk, that was really good and spot money. on when he stepped up. Oh, it was money. So that tells me, oh, okay, they know they know what they've got. It's Temple too, right? Do you really want to just overextend yourself against a team that you're going to blow out? Honestly, I kind of feel the same way about Houston this week. They're ranked right now in like 130th overall in um, efficiency. And John, I'm going to be honest, should we extend ourselves much in this game? I mean, I know they're going to open the playbook because they need to practice it, but do we really need to extend? Yeah, I, I don't know if they need to. I really don't think they need to. I thought of it the other day this way. I said, when you're playing your little brother in hoops and you know you can beat your little brother in hoops, what do you do? For me, I just would just jack threes. Like toy them. Yeah. You know, you just just play or you just post up and and you know shoot hook shots or whatever. And I'm not a big guy. I'm only like five nine, five ten. <laughs> so it's not like I had, you know, this towering height over my little brother, but I was much better than him. And it was obvious on the basketball court. And so I would just kind of do whatever I wanted to. And some days it was like, didn't really want to try very hard. I didn't really want to pull out all my handles. I didn't really want to you know, pull out all my moves to the basket. And so I'd just sit outside and just jack threes. And some would go in and some wouldn't. Some wouldn't. But at the end of the day, I would win. Similar to you run some run plays. Some would work. Some wouldn't. Some pass plays. Some would work. And some wouldn't against Temple. True. But at the end of the day, you won by 48 points. Right, right. And then I love, I love that Jackson Arnold said that too. It's like, we won by 28. Who cares? Right? We got there. We got to the number we wanted to. We blew them out. We covered the spread. I mean, who truly cares? But what's funny too, John, add to this, ESPN dropped their top 25. The, the football power index basically came out for week two going into it. And 13th in, you know, we're 13 in the coaches poll, AP poll, we're what, 15? 15. 15? ESPN, the, the football power index, which means that your favorability on a neutral site, we're ninth right now. And it appears that in those games, the only teams ahead of us, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Texas, and Alabama that we play, the computers think we'd be a favorite against Missouri on a neutral site, LSU on a neutral site, Auburn on a neutral site. So yeah, it and everybody else. It sounds like the only four teams we would truly not be a favorite on a neutral site. And I think that Tennessee line will be really close because right now, I think the anticipated spread is us being a three point two to three point favorite in that game. Probably two, maybe it's one. Basically even money. 
Exactly. exactly. It's basically even money in that entire time. So yeah, it's it's interesting to see the, the disparity between those two because 15 and the AP poll, kind of weird to me. It's like, really? I mean, the coaches think we're at 13. What is it about these teams ahead of us? Why did you make USC jumpers? Did you really take all of the LSU game? And we'll talk about that a little bit later too, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, if you go look at the ESPN matchup predictor, which I, I put out an article every single week over at Sooners Wire, just breaking mm-hmm. down how the ESPN matchup predictor changes from week to week. And last week, going into week one, Oklahoma was slated to go nine and three. This week after week one, eight and four. Yep. And the games that you mentioned are the ones that they are not uh, the projected winner in those games. And with Tennessee, it is like slight. It's like 50.5% to 49.5%. So it's basically, like you said, a three-point spread in favor in favor of Oklahoma. Again, when you're at home, the betters give you three points. So basically, that is an even line uh, yep. for Oklahoma. But we'll see how that one plays out here in a couple of weeks as the Oklahoma Sooners are now going to get ready for Houston. Brent Venables praised a lot of young guys, also talked about some guys that are going to be back for this weekend's action in uh, Norman. We'll talk about that next, coming up here on Locked On Sooners. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more whatever you're into speed power or style ebay motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you'll always find exactly what you're looking for and with ebay's guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash with all the parts you need at the price you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home the huge win so keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions apply ebay guarantee fit only available to u.s customers Again, thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Shout out to all the everydayers. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. Also, go check out the Locked On Sooners Insider Program, where we will chat with you about any questions you have about Oklahoma Sooners. You got mailbag questions you want us to answer here on the show? Subscribe to the Locked On Sooners Insider Program by texting SEC2024 to 405-817-6711 over at 405-817-6711 for the Locked On Sooners Insider Program. Now, Jay, Brent Venables had some high praise for some youngins on the roster. Oklahoma's relying on a lot of first-year players to be impactful for them in 2024. Jay, what did he have to say? Yeah, so there was a couple of things that I heard from the um, from the press conference that Venables did. One, he talked about Taylor Tatum, and he talked about he's been really good. He, he, he likes that he took advantage of the opportunity that was in front of him. He also mentioned that DeMarco Murray doesn't like the fact that he smiles too much, which I thought was quite hilarious. <laughs> but at the same time, totally get it. The dude looks happy all the time. Every time I've seen the camera pan to him, pictures of him, even when he's running, it looks like he's smiling when he's about to truck somebody. It's quite hilarious. While at the same time, you know that he is definitely doing it. Um, he, he He's excited about the opportunities he's placed in front of him. From there, you also had like Dominic Williams. He talked about Dominic. He talked about Grayson Halton, even gave some updates on injuries. And we'll get in that in just a minute. But one thing he mentioned, he said, I love Dominic. Here's his quote. He likes to be coached. He's very, he's a very communicative, relational guy. He's going to ask you how your day is, how your family is before you can ask him about his day and going how his family is. He also loves to get the criticism, right? He wants you to tell him how he's performing, how he's doing. And John, when you think about that, how big is that to have a player like that that's one of your leaders on the defensive line? It, it's huge. As you're trying to kind of establish the standard, that's what they talk about all the time, right, is the standard. And mm, I think it exactly. started when Brent Venables had that conversation with Danny Stutzman in the spring of 2022. You know, he, he talked with Stutzman about, hey, you're a goofball. If you want to be serious about your craft, we got to get serious about our craft. And I think that kind of set the tone a little bit. And we've seen how it's progressed. And I think you can see that, hey, when you point to Danny Stutzman, people will, will listen. Like now you point to a guy like Dominic Williams, 
who had an impact first couple of years at TCU, but came to Oklahoma ready to be coached, ready mm-hmm. to be coached by Todd Bates, by Zach Alley, Brent Venables, by Miguel Chavis, like not sitting there acting all high and mighty because he was a freshman all of them, all American went to the national title game with TCU. No, he was ready to continue to develop his craft so that he could go to the next level and and be successful. And and who better to do it under than Todd Bates and Brent Venables, who had Christian Wilkins and Dexter Lawrence and Gerald McCoy and Tommy Harris. Like these luminaries of college football at defensive tackle came through programs led by Brent Venables on defense. So Dominic Williams has the right attitude. I think you can see this say the same thing about a guy like Deion Burks, like the what he's doing for Rob's ranch and the way that he's been able to raise money in such a short period of time to impact lives like it just it's the right kind of guy mentality and brent venables has really been working to build a culture and he's done it he's established a culture that isn't a me first it's not self-centered it's really it's team first and it's even beyond the team it's community focused it's social awareness focused yeah what these guys do in the off season by going out of the country and, and taking trips. Like it, it's crazy that in such a short time that they could have the roster turnover that they've had be a competitive football team and have the right culture already in place. No, you're hundred percent spot on with that and doing the mission trips and everything. It's really cool to see that he's getting guys with the character that you're looking for. Now I say this and I say this firmly to you sooner fans. If you would like us to continue to do that, you have to give grace and patience to Coach Venables and staff with their recruiting. Yep. They're not going to be able to get every single five-star player that you all want because not every five-star player are built in this type of you know personality. Not like all of them fit. are built to be this type of community type people. I mean, y'all have seen the diva-ishness we've seen from some of these five stars, especially when it comes to recruiting. So... If you want this staff to continue to get guys with this type of character that you all will be excited about, let them do their jobs and be patient with the types and the the, the, the types of players they go after and get, right? You're not going to win all of the battles that you want with some players. But again, like you said, John, they're finding guys that fit the mold of what they're trying to get, not only being really good on the field, but also being good as men. It makes me think about... Uh, Jim Harbaugh and his first stint at Stanford, right? Or or his stint at Stanford. And the one thing that Stanford always struggled with was getting good players, mainly because of the academic standards. Same thing with Notre Dame. There's two schools that always struggle with that. Georgia Tech's another example. Academically, it's really tough to get into those institutions. But when they were able to find not only good football players, but smart ones and pair them together, you start to see that success in time, right? That's something that you have to, it has takes not only evaluation and development, but you got to give the coaches just the, the grace to understand that, no, you're not going to land the number one player in the country all the time, unless he's the type of player that has the type of character you're looking for at your program. So just keep that in mind when you think. Well, about it's it. kind of similar to the Iowa State thing, right? Yep. Attracting three-star guys with five-star mentalities or five-star yep. mindsets or five-star culture fits. I think the same is true at Oklahoma, but you're able to do it at a much higher level with a much higher recruiting ceiling. You know, you look at, I look at a guy like, you know, Michael Boganowski. He was not the most highly sought after safety in the country, but how excited are we ha- to have him on this roster? When you see him Uber hit, excited. Oof. When you the, the recruits we have now, like Amarion Robinson, as well as Marcus Wimberly, the way that we've seen those safeties hit too, mm-hmm. yeah. That, that you get it, yeah. They may be rated at three star ish, four star. Ryan Foge was a great example. He was a three star when we first landed him, and then all of a sudden he started flying up the charts when everybody saw. Wait, Beatonbow wants him. What Unranked do they see? Offered him. What do they see in this guy? Because he was, I think Beatonbow was at his first big offer, yep. and then from there they're like, oh no 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 no, that kid's got talent. Yeah, shoot his rankings up. Right, we lucked out and, this and time. A, and a lot of times it's the stuff that you can't, you can't. uh tangibly grade whether it's right. film or a 40 time or a you know broad jump like that's the stuff that you can objectively analyze a lot of the stuff that's up here and in, in here you can't put on a spreadsheet At you all. can't evaluate and compare you can only do that with face-to-face and one-on-ones and and so like when brent venables offers a dude you got to know that one he's a good football player and two he's got the right mentality it's exactly it's, it's going to be both things so, and don't get it uh, twisted yeah. we do whiff sometimes we do it, 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 you can't bat a thousand it's impossible we've never Bill seen a Belichick baseball missed. player do it 
Right. <laughs> it just Nick Saban missed. It is what it is. Exactly. It is what yeah. it is. But hopefully you you win you hit more, you bat better than you uh than you strike out. Let's put it that way. That's right. Hey, real quickly before we get into our SEC recap, uh some injury notes. Uh Brent Venables mentioned that Jaquay's Petaway had kind of been battling a hamstring injury, uh, but looks like he's ramped up, maybe ready to go for week two. What does that do for Oklahoma's wide receiver depth chart with Jalil Farouk out? Oh, it's going to open things up a lot, right? So that gives Burks an opportunity to really step out and take a break at the at the at the slot position. But if Petaway really shows up, you can move him to the outside and get him out there in like you know an X or or a Y occasionally, right? I mean, he's more of a little speedster. Him and Zion Ragin, they they're they Venables praised in practice. Both made some pretty excellent catches and they're both shifty and fast enough that there's a good chance you can see him on the field. So imagine us going out there four wide with two fast dudes in the slot and your big guys on the outside and boom, you start flying at them. There's a good chance, man, in this game, we may really show out in the past game. And so I think that that really helps the room, especially now you're getting more and more healthy and you're going to start seeing some of the, the guys that don't have the name that we're used to yet, the household names, mm -hmm. they're going to be having an opportunity to really shine, kind of like Tatum did when he got in the field at running back. Yeah, and, and I think, hey, this week, let's see a little Brennan Thompson, Deion Burks, Jaquez Petaway, and uh, oh. Zion Raggins. Like, let's see all four of your speedsters out on the field and, and – dare Houston to try to cover all of, the, all of them and and then throw Javante Barnes in the backfield so he can hammer it up the middle on a halfback dive and four wide. That I'll take two. Hard. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential there. Now you do maybe worry about a little bit of the size with those four if you're having multiple on the field at the same time. Not Deion Burks, that dude just lifts a truck every time he's, he's uh, exactly. in the weight room. Um, but, you know, you won't have as much size in the blocking game. Uh, with maybe a, a Petaway and a Brennan Thompson on the outside. So just something to consider. Not that big of a deal. What I did like is that how much they ran two tight end sets. You saw a lot of Bauer Sharp and Jake Roberts on the field at the same time. I bet True. we'll see more of that because maybe your wide receiver depth is a little bit hindered and dinged up right now. But you do have two really reliable options in Bauer Sharp and Jake Roberts that you can run two tight end formations out of. You can split Sharp out into the slot, use him out there a little bit more. So I think there's a lot of different things that they can do to kind of work through the wide receiver depth chart issues that they might be having right now, especially as you ramp Andrew Anthony up, Nick Anderson up, and get them back up to game speed. The SEC had a wild week one. We'll discuss coming up next here on Locked On Sooners. You've heard about it. You heard to talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you this time. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers that bet $5 get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. So then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. Can't beat that, right? All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. So just visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. So the Oklahoma Sears won 51-3. There are a lot of uh, interesting matchups across the SEC. Let's start with the notable ones really here, Jay. Uh, Notre Dame goes down to College Station, beats Texas A&M. What was kind of your reaction to that? <sighs> right I, I don't know i don't know john how'd you feel about it <laughs> well one i picked notre dame to beat texas a&m so I, I feel great about that uh made me a little bit of money you did you sure did you were one of the the one people that picked notre dame yeah, yeah. and so i you want to give you want to give me and marcus freeman two and a half points please i'll take that I like Marcus Freeman. I think he's a really good coach. And, and yes, he's Agreed. a young coach. And yes, he hasn't done everything perfectly. But the dude's a really, really good coach. It's going to do a lot of really good things at Notre Dame for a really long time. So that was just a good signature win for them. Look, man, I'm trying to figure out these people that kept telling me Connor Weigman was going to be good. And that's kind of where I'm just like, every time I think, just, uh. It, Listen, I didn't think he'd have as bad of a game as he had. Like three, he was three awful, yards per <laughs> terrible. Ter I didn't either. Because last season he had those moments where it stuck out. You're like, oh, yep. okay, that maybe so. No, no, he he regressed quickly. Now, 
Granted, I will give props to Notre Dame because I've been hearing all in the offseason that their defense was going to be quite stout, right? I think Watts is back there in the secondary, considered mm-hmm. one of the best uh, DBs in the country uh, in general. And so I was like, okay, they'll probably have a really good defense. Marcus Freeman is really good at that. He did well you know, in all of his stops. But geez, Louise, it just felt like this was just it felt like Texas A&M did not even watch film. And I love seeing Elko on the sideline curse and run the the ball. Oh, and it's yeah. like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, they they missed Ruben Owens. Let's just put it that way. It's what it feels like. Well, what's crazy is, one, Mike Elko, don't you have a headset set? And can't you tell them to run the ball? Or do you just not use headsets? I don't, I don't, that, was, that was kind of my observation. He was before. wearing a headset. That's the funny part. I just, I, I guess, like, I don't know. I guess it just want, wasn't related. You want them to tell to run the ball. I don't know. Uh, Georgia was a 13 and a half point favorite over Clemson in Atlanta oh and beat the Tigers by 31 points. Uh, we were talking before the show. Georgia is a team on a mission. I think they're going to go undefeated this year and win the national championship. Yeah, I, I so to me, what this feels like for Oklahoma is that if my prediction of them going to the SEC championship game does hold true, our defense is going to have to really be stout and healthy if we're going to go up against this Georgia team because Beck looked comfortable, physical. fast, physical. And the funny thing is Clemson did very good up until after half. That's when their offense forgot how to play football and Georgia's defense turned up. The, they turn up a notch. I mean, it was 6-0 at the half. So you're like, okay, this is going to be a good game. It may end yep. up being like 20-13 to 13 and we're going to be – no, no. It's just Georgia turned on the afterburners and Clemson did not have the depth to handle it. And just the attrition started getting them. They just looked like they were tired. And it was just – they were getting picked apart. That to me is for Oklahoma, if we make it up there – we're going to have to be prepared to be able to go three deep and keep pressure not only on Beck, but not let those wide receivers cook us. And, or the run game. That run game was just destroying Clemson in the second yeah. half. So, yeah, they're, they're looking like they're go, they're just going to walk right into the college football playoff bye week and uh, not even look back. I think everyone in front of them is going to – hopefully – um, they steamroll everybody up until the last week of the season, and then they start feeling like down, and they start looking tired, and then we can just push them over the ledge uh, in the SEC championship game. It'd be nice, but if they can make it to this, if they make it to the SEC title game undefeated, I don't think there's anybody in the SEC that's going to stop them. Anyway, I concur, uh, unless it's Oklahoma. Um, yeah. USC LSU the Sunday night game. We're, we're not going chronologically here. We're going by like order of importance here. Uh, USC LSU, man, LSU had a chance. Inside the 15 yard line, under two minutes to play, first and 10. And hey, they get a nice little chunk on, on first down, maybe three, four yards, and then just forgot what they were doing altogether on second down. They try to run a little swing pass out to the running back, and Garrett Nussmeyer just buries it into the ground. Like he was, looked like he was trying to spike the football. And then on third down, one, you get the, the uh, procedural penalty. Uh, so you lose the down anyway, but that was his, his answer to that was to not call the timeout, which he almost did, but just to throw it into double coverage and had no chance of, of coming down with it. John, it's more of a, the decision making in that game just felt bad. Right. And I say that in this light, why did they not kick a field goal on that first drive on fourth and go? Why did they get greedy thinking that it would be okay to go ahead and just go for the touchdown on fourth down, and then they missed it? They kicked the field goal. This whole game is different. At, this whole game plays out into a different look, right? And it's mainly because you're up 3-0, and if the game plays the same as it did, when, when USC finally scored, you're up 23-20, and instead of – you're trying to kill clock, and then they have to go with the game-winning drive – which would have been a heck of a lot better situation than, you know, everything else that played out in that game. I just don't, I hated the decision of doing that that early, especially because they were barely moving in the goal line anyway. It looked like they were struggling to even get yards. I gotta say, Texas. Yeah, I gotta say, um, it looked like Riley's got himself a little bit of a defense to start, right? Or LSU yeah. is just not as good as everybody's trying to predict them to be. Because I promise you, that offensive line did not look like a stonewall like I thought it was going to be. 
Yeah, listen, I'm going to give Danton Lynn some credit. I think the dude's a really good defensive coordinator, so I think there's a chance that yep. USC could have a good defense, and we heard reports of this offseason them taking strength and conditioning seriously and trying to bulk up a little bit. So if that's the case, maybe USC is who we saw on Sunday night. However, LSU I don't think is going to be as good as – or at least I don't think they're as good right now – as everybody expects them to be. I think by the end of the season, when Oklahoma plays them, they could be as good as the, you know, a top 15 team in the nation by that point. But right now I think they still got some things to work on. Uh, some other notable game here, Florida, Miami. Okay. I tooted my horn early and I, and I, I picked Notre Dame over AM, but I also picked Florida to beat Miami. So I'm also going to punch myself in the gut on that one. Give me that one. I took Miami in that game and yeah, I, I knew that Cam Ward was going to be a problem. And he was even more of a problem a than problem, I even problem. predicted. He yeah. is good, right? To me, is when he settled, like I talked about him a lot when I did the Bleach Report show and we talked about Washington State. Every game I picked him because dude is just dynamic whenever he's not only in control, but he's got the talent around him, right? At a certain point, Washington State just didn't have the talent to keep up what they were doing. Miami's got that. They've got all the bodies that he need, and boy, was he showing out. He looked poised. He looked calm. He looked like no matter what Florida was going to try to do, he was just like, man, I'm good. He's going to be a problem in the ACC this season, and heck, if he, if he, if he keeps that up, they're winning the ACC because Florida yep. State's already down the in the in the dumper, and, and Clemson, they may not be able to handle him at all this season. Yeah, Miami might go undefeated this year. Yeah, they have a chance. Crazy, but they might. Uh yeah, it, it Cam Ward's really, really good. Mario Cristobal is a good recruiter. And so it was just a matter of time until he kind of had that thing up and running. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, making sure everything fit together. And, and it sounds like and seems like right now they've got the right guy at the helm with Cam Ward to lead the way. Virginia Tech, another one of my picks. And probably most 99% of the people in the country picked the, the Hokies to cover the spread against uh, Vanderbilt. But Clark Leah, Diego Pavia, they got something cooking right now in uh in, in at Vanderbilt. That was a really, really, really good win for them. They're gonna be in a pain in a lot of teams' side. They're gonna be a thorn in some sides this season yep. in the SEC. Look, I know we love to bag on Vanderbilt. I mean it's always been a running joke, but yep. if they can get close to the James Franklin era where they're super physical and they've got a solid quarterback, they're gonna be a problem in yep. the SEC. Uh, if they may not win a lot of games, but they're gonna they're going to be annoying to a lot of teams. If anything, the most free money you was going to get was taking Vanderbilt over the two and a half wins. They're going to win three games. Yeah, no problem. yeah they're definitely going to win over three. It, it was uh, it was really kind of fun to watch Diego Pavia a little bit because he's exactly the quarterback they needed. Someone who can pick up a few yards on the ground. He can hit the throws he needs to hit. He's not going to turn the football over. And that gives them a great opportunity to win. If you can just keep moving the chains, which is what they did, just little by little by little by little, they just just drove the football down the field on the Hokies and were able to convert it into touchdowns. I mean, it was a, just a really, really impressive performance, especially even after going up big in the first half and then falling behind late in the second half and then being able to hold on and, and come through in overtime. So it just showed a really a lot of resiliency. So there were a lot of like buy games this week in college in the SEC, not ones that were you know huge matchups aside from the ones that we talked about. Was there a performance out there, Jay, that you thought was really impressive or the most impressive in a buy game? I'd say Nico Yamaliava went out there and showed us why he was considered a top quarterback in his class right 314 three touchdowns he looked very comfortable out there and if anything when you're playing a game like uh, a team like Chattanooga who you know no nobody really knows about the goal is to just go out there and look and feel comfortable and he did like the pressure was really wasn't there he was putting the ball in some good spots I think Nico had himself a solid game so I'm really intrigued to see what they look like next week against North Carolina State I got a couple I'm going to start with Jackson Dart because that's the obvious one. Dude started his oh. Heisman campaign off with a thunderous start. Almost 500 yards of total offense, six total touchdowns. But then the other one was really, really fun. Jalen Milrow is going to be a huge beneficiary of Kalen DeBoer. He threw the ball nine times. He was eight of nine for 200 yards. He averaged 22 yards per attempt. Unreal. This is going to be like Jalen Hurts coming to Oklahoma in 2019, I think, with Jalen Milrow. So just a, a lot of really fascinating results out there this weekend. 
one more though too you got to give it to um our old guy over there jeff levy in mississippi state blake shaven out like there 15 for 22 right he did not look like the blake shaven from baylor right i mean 15 for 22 47 three touchdowns he kind of looked good and he ran the ball 44 times for a tutty for yeah. 44 yards for a tutty with seven uh carries it they look a lot more interesting than i thought that 65 yard touchdown to start the game was like oh okay this is what we're doing okay, okay. well okay. and uh, of oklahoma note auburn beat alabama a and 73 to 3 and peyton thorn threw for 322 yards so <laughs> if you're expecting the peyton thorn from last year maybe we're getting the peyton thorn from 3,000 yard passing at michigan state uh peyton thorn we'll see uh, oklahoma will find out exactly what auburn's going to look like here in a few weeks when they travel down to auburn alabama on september 28th for that first sec road game make I'll sure you're there. tuned in Jay's going to be there. Make sure you're tuned in to Locked On Sooners as we get you ready for Houston this week and Tulane the next week. SEC play coming not soon, not long after. Uh, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all platforms and on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button and that notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. Follow Jay at Unfair Sports, myself at John Nine Williams. The show is at Locked On Sooners on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you get your social media fix. But until next time, he's Jay Smith. I'm John Williams. We'll talk to you then. Boomer. Sooner.